hydrogen and oxygen. The conflict between the larger planets resulted in long stretched filaments ejected by a disturbed Saturn to cross the Earth's orbit. The hydrogen of the planet combined with the oxygen of the terrestrial atmosphere in electrical discharges and turned into water. There are definite indications of a drastic drop in the atmospheric oxygen at the time of the deluge. For instance, the survivors of the catastrophe are said in many sources to have been unable to light fires. The consumption of the oxygen in the air by its conversion into water could not fail to have a marked effect upon all that breathes. The animal life that survived needed to accommodate itself to the changed conditions. According to rabbinical sources, before the deluge, man was vegetarian, and the post-diluvian population did not continue the vegetarian habits of the sinful population of the earth. The Talmud and Midrashim narrate that after the deluge, a carnivorous instinct was awakened in animal and man, and everyone had the impulse to bite. Fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the air, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I will give you everything. The prohibition against quenching the thirst for blood is an ordinance said to have been introduced immediately after the deluge. In a teleological program, this result of the deluge does not seem appropriate for a catastrophe brought about to chastise the human race and the animals, to cleanse them of their vices and make them better. Because of its non program appearance, the carnivorous urge must have been not a mythological motif, but a result of physiological changes, most probably an anemia connected with the diminution, diminution. diminution of oxygen in the air, was responsible for the new inclination. Such were the accounts of the Sioux, Menominee, and other Indian tribes, as told by J.G. Frazier in his remarks to volume two of Apollodorus, the library in the Loeb series. Piranha describing the deluged world in which nothing could be seen, fire there was not, nor moon, nor sun. The flood legend in Sanskrit literature, even in the relatively slightly rarefied atmosphere of La Paz, Bolivia, because of the reduced oxygen content, fires start with such reluctance that there is little work for the city's fire department. A handbook for Bolivia, Washington, 1974. The Book of Enoch, 8911. After the deluge, they began to bite one another, according to the Midrash Agata, to Genesis 10.8. Nimrod was the first to eat meat. I take it Nimrod wasn't too smart. <laughs> that might be why people get called a Nimrod nowadays. <laughs> I'm only guessing. Genesis 9, 2, and 3. Genesis 9, I don't know what that means. One might speculate that the diet of meat would be conducive to the production of the additional red blood cells needed by the body to absorb more efficiently the diminished amount of oxygen entering the lungs. In Tibet, the high altitude and rarefied atmosphere is said to make it impossible to follow the vegetarian diet advocated by Buddhist teaching. CF Science, Volume 203, 1979. At high altitudes, all animals hyperventilate, an involuntary mechanism of fast breathing in which carbon dioxide causes the pH of the blood to become alkaline and constricts blood vessels. This, in turn, reduces the blood flow to the brain, and brain cells become starved of oxygen, eventually dying. An alkaline pH in the blood can also produce other fatal effects. The term pH means potentials of hydrogen. Human blood stays in a very narrow pH range, right around 7.35 to 7.45. Below or above this range means symptoms and disease. If blood pH moves too much below 6.8 or above 7.8, cells stop functioning and the patient dies. An ideal pH for the blood is 7.4. See all the great things you learn on the Greg J channel. Acidity and alkalinity are expressed on the pH scale, which ranges from 0 to 14. A pH of 7 is in the middle of this scale, is neutral. I always get drinking water. It should be spring water and have a pH higher than 7.4. I talk to my water, too. Water has memory, and you know about the experiments, I'm sure. But I thank my water and tell it I love it. <laughs>
Seriously, I do. It's kind of synchronicitous that I found this right around the same time I found this video by Suspicious Observer. I don't know a lot about the YouTube channel, but he's got a lot of subscribers. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy that just deals with the facts, and I like it. It's very important we know these things. But everything I've seen so far looks pretty solid. And I just hope that uh, something happens to the good for our shifting magnetic north and south. Because it doesn't look really promising for us. You know, I, I'm not a doomsayer. So I'm a glass half full guy. You know, I don't like to say the sky is falling. I, I really don't like it at all. But it is something we need to pay attention to. Because if something like that happens, we don't want to get caught defenseless. We want to be prepared for it as best as we can. To inform the folks so that you're in the know too. Rainbow. After the deluge, the hope grew into faith that no such or similar destruction would again come to decimate mankind. The story is told that the Lord made a covenant with Noah, and the following were the terms of the covenant. Then God said to Noah, I established my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. As a visible sign of the obligation not to repeat the catastrophe, a colorful rainbow appeared for the first time after the deluge. It was a new and till then unknown atmospheric phenomenon, and this colored refraction of sunlight in small and suspended drops of water, the rescued believed to see the divine promise not to repeat the flood. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant. The covenant, according to the moral conception of the Hebrews, was a reciprocal deed. It was kept only in its promise not to bring a paramount flood upon Upon the earth. The earth and man continued to be shaped and reshaped in further catastrophes before the close of the age of creation. That is the theme of the book of Genesis. References Genesis 9, 8, 11 and Genesis 12, 15 is, according to Genesis 2, 5, 6, no rain fell on the newly created earth, which was watered only by a mist ascending from the ground, falling as dew. If this phenomenon persisted until the deluge, this would explain the novelty of the rainbow after the catastrophe. Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, the Spanish conquistador who traveled in the Andes in the 16th century, recorded in his Historia de los Incas a tale about Manco Capac, the first Inca, which has a curious resemblance to the biblical story. Emerging from a cave after the reappearance of the sun, Manco Capac and his brothers arrived at the mountain which has two leagues, approximately from the town of Cusco, and climbing to the top, they saw in it the rainbow, which the natives call Guanacuari, and interpreting it as a favorable omen. Manco Capac said, consider this a sign that the world will not again be destroyed by water. The rainbow was depicted on the altar of the Cori Cancha in the temple of Veracocha in Cusco, CRT Zedima. If, as Duardu Cordona has suggested, the reference to the rainbow in this passage is to the rings of Saturn, a suggestion with which I tend to concur. The bondage of Saturn and its rings may have been regarded as a guarantee of its future behavior.
In Irish mythology, the pot of gold is hidden at the end of a rainbow by a small member of the fairy family called the leprechaun. Humans who are lucky enough to spot a leprechaun by following the rainbow may still have problems catching him because the fairies bestowed upon leprechauns the magical ability to disappear. The leprechaun is considered a trickster who often appears at night and is the cause of small mishaps around the house. So that's what it is. I swear there's one here. There is something that likes to move things around on me. I know I'm not crazy. <laughs> the leprechaun is most often depicted as a very small old man wearing a leather apron and dressed in green. He usually has large silver buckles on his shoes. Although wary and mistrustful of humans, the leprechaun is known to occasionally ride sheep or even the family dog for sport. All leprechauns love gold and have their very own pot. Even though the rainbow tells people where the pot is, humans have to catch the leprechaun first in order to find it. Since fairies granted leprechauns the magical ability to grant three wishes or disappear, it is next to impossible for a person to actually find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Nevertheless, seeing a rainbow is still considered by many a sign of good fortune or luck. And that was from this article here. I will leave a link below. As you go along and you get into this more and more, it just becomes so apparent that just about every part of any tradition that cultures have stems from this happening. Even take Halloween, you know, November 1st is the Day of the Dead, but people like to be frightened in a safe environment. The haunted house industry is huge. I wonder if that desire to be scared comes from, if it has something to do with it. I bet it does. In the story of the Universal Deluge, it is said, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Five months later, according to the book of Genesis, on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark rested upon Ararat. In Egyptian religious belief, Osiris was drowned on the 17th day of the month at Thir. Why does that remind me of the ether? fast for Tammuz, commemorating his descent into the netherworld, began on the 17th of the month, named for him. Although the similarity of the Babylonian and biblical versions of the story of the deluge was repeatedly stressed, the significance of the number 17 in the story of Tammuz, in relation to the same number in the book of Genesis, was not emphasized or even noticed. The feast of Saturnalia began always on the 17th of December, and with time in imperial Rome, when it was celebrated for three consecutive days, it began on the 15th and continued for two more days until the 17th. The connection between the number 17 and the deluge is thus not confined to the biblical, Babylonian, and Egyptian sources. We meet it also in Roman beliefs and practices. The significance of the number 17 and of the mystery plays related to Osiris drowning and in the festivities of Saturnalia as an indication of these memorials were related to the deluge. Plutarch, the coincidence of the Bible date the beginning of the deluge with the date of Osiris' disappearance or drowning was noted by the 18th century scholar Jacob Bryant, who claimed in addition that in both accounts the month was the second after the autumn equinox. Analysis of Ancient Mythology, 2nd edition, London, 1775. On page 334, Bryant also believed that in this history of Osiris, we have a memorial of the patriarch and the deluge. The identity of the two dates has been noted by several other authors, among them George St. Clair. See his creation records discovered in Egypt, London, 1898. On page 437, on significance of the date 17 in Egypt, C.F. Griffiths, Plutarch, and H.E. Winlock, Origin of the Ancient Egyptian Calendar, Throughout the Coptic and Arab times, at least the night of June 17 was celebrated as the night of the drop, when it was believed that a miraculous drop fell 
into the Nile, causing it to rise. According to Langdon, in Babylonia, the god Tammuz was said to have descended to the tower to the lower world on the 18th of Tammuz, and to have risen on the 28th of Kislev, December. Babylonian Menologies and the Semitic calendars, London 1935. Originally the date had been the 17th, but when the reckoning of time was altered to the extent of making the day begin with sunrise instead of with the approach of night, M. Jastrow, The Religion of Babylonia and Assyria, Boston, 1898. The 18th day of the month began about 12 hours earlier and encroached upon the daylight hours of the 17th day, which were now counted as part of the 18th. According to rabbinical sources, the end of the 40 days of rain mentioned in Genesis account came on the 27th Kislev, the very same day as the 28th of Kislev in the Babylonian reckoning when Tammuz is said to have risen. Macrobia, Saturnalia 1. <laughs> happy to report Mr. Wall Thornhill has made it into mainstream, or at least one of his Thornhillisms. Uh, check this out. More than 300 years since Isaac Newton came up with the universal law of gravity, inspired, as the story goes, by seeing an apple fall from a tree. Today it seems obvious that gravity is a powerful force. It would seem to most people that gravity is a very important force. It's very strong. It's very hard to get up in the morning, stand up. And when things fall, they break because gravity is strong. The fact of the matter is that it's not strong. It's, it's really a, a very weak force. Gravity pulls us down to the Earth and keeps our Earth in orbit around the sun. But in fact, we overcome the force of gravity all the time. It's not that hard. Even with the gravity of the entire Earth pulling this apple downward, the muscles in my arm can easily overcome it. And it's not just our muscles that put gravity to shame. Magnets can do it too, no sweat. Magnets carry a different force, the electromagnetic force. That's the same force behind light and electricity. It turns out that electromagnetism is much, much stronger than gravity. Gravity, in comparison, is amazingly weak. How weak? The electromagnetic force is some thousand, billion, 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 billion times stronger. That's a one with 39 zeros following it. The weakness of gravity has confounded scientists for decades. But now, with the radical world of string theory... <laughs> that could have only come from one place. The first place I heard it, from Thunderbolts of the Gods. That's the Wall Thornhillism. And they got it right all the way up until they started blaming it on string theory. I swear, you could slap them in the face with the truth and they just keep on going. And they always show the planet sitting in this pocket. I just wonder, why is it they never explain why it is that that planet can bend that space? Because if you put it out there, it would just keep going. So like Wall says, they use gravity on Earth to exemplify gravity. They spent billions on a gravity wave detector and don't even know what they're looking for. They're looking for something, gravity waves. So if you're looking for waves of gravity, what medium would those waves be traveling through? Would that mean that you're suggesting there's an ether? Of course there's an ether, but relativity doesn't allow it. Well, we'll just ignore that. We won't talk about it. We all know it, but that's another show. And they're using the gravity on Earth just kind of nonsense. The electromagnetic force is more powerful than gravity, so that means it must be string theory. Anything but what it is. Electricity. Okay, we're immersed in the ether, right? I recently heard uh, someone mention, are we floating in the ether through it or are we floating with it? I thought that was a pretty interesting question. I've been pondering it. What do you think? All I can say is it's a start. At least we know they're paying attention. 
Where was it the uh, Roman Empire gravitated to anyway, if it truly even existed like we think it did? It's kind of amazing though that these peoples must have had their calendars in sync. There's a lot we don't know, or we're not being told. Definitely something that makes you go, hmm, or maybe more like, hmm. Thank you. 